Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Day. I'm the vice president for We the Women Voters Johnson County. Um, and what we were talking about, you, you've seen the cards on your seats. Hopefully everybody has a pen. Um, if you don't, let us know or grab your neighbor's pen. I'm sure they'll be willing to share. Um, just write down your questions that come to you throughout this meeting um, and we'll come around and gather them as, uh, as the, the panelists are having their discussion. We'll bring them together, make sure nothing's being repeated uh, and that nothing has gone too partisan. <laughs> and then uh, and we'll make sure that we get those questions answered for you, okay? So I join Janet and Connie and my thanks for your willingness to be here on this. I was gonna say lovely spring morning. I didn't realize it was gonna be a little bit cloudy outside, but still it's gonna be a nice day. Um, and to learn from our uh, fabulous panelists uh, that are so focused that have comprised today's panel. So I recently heard the phrase that democracy is local. It inspired me to develop this program so that we could explore this concept as a group and help share that inspiration during a time when a feeling of community may be waning a bit for some. Hundreds of volunteers throughout the county help our governments make decisions about urban planning, our parks, sustainability <laughs> efforts, our police partnerships, and so very much more. Citizen participation in county and city boards and committees, as well as in our schools and libraries, helps to expand on a sense of partnership and trust between communities and their government. It creates a personal connection that helps fight the negative rhetoric we're hearing too often lately. So before we start uh, the program with our panelists, I'd like to introduce a member of our DEI committee, Farah Marhusen, who will discuss the concept of intersectionality in local democracy. Thank you, Jen. Oh, you're on the camera. Good job. Sorry, if you block your file. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. And, you know, like, the concept of intersectionality in local democracy, and I have five minutes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Don't make me work my donuts. Good morning. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Aaron Hussein, and I'm here to talk a little bit about intersectionality. And before I start, I'd like to see a show of hands. Like, how many of you are know that word intersectionality or the concept of it? Mm -hmm. Oh, wonderful! Mm -hmm. Great, you're cutting my you're cutting my job short. Really? Okay. Mm -hmm. And under what circumstances do you hear the words um, intersectionality? No, 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 Intersectionality is also a tool, a framework, you know, for understanding how our various social and political identities combine and create our own unique experiences. It's also a fantastic tool for self-reflection um, and self-work for an individual. And I know like in institutions and colleges and universities, they apply the framework of intersectionality in, uh, for example, the college admissions process. You know, we no longer just look at the grades and GPAs and test scores, we look at the whole overall picture of the applicant. That includes their gender identity, their um, geographic background, the parents' income. It All this tells a story of that one person. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that when we do this, um, it contributes to a diversity of lived experiences in a student body which in turn can contribute to new ideas, new concepts, new solutions, even the right solution. So that's why it's very important to apply intersectionality when we talk about diversity and inclusion and, um, and sorry, equity and inclusivity, DEI, I have to say that. <laughs> so what does this have to do with you know, democracy and you know, being at a local bit? Well, it has nothing to do with college admissions process, that's for sure. However, you know, the phase, to me personally, the phase um, that, that, that democracy being local implies that social change that we really wish to see as American citizens um, and the action to make those changes take closer to, you know, takes place closer to home than one might expect. Mm -hmm. 
It involves connecting with our neighbors, our community, we build trust and solidarity so that we can stand as a collective. And only then we can start building partnerships with external institutions by participating in local and county and city boards, committees, as our panelists later on will demonstrate. So earlier, I have one more minute, I promise. So earlier I mentioned that intersectionality is a fantastic tool for self-reflection as well as identifying barriers that prevent communities from thriving. And how does that work? Um, well, I'm, I'm a big, firm believer that in order for me to see any change, any external change around me, I have to start with change myself first. Mm -hmm. So when you apply intersectionality as a self-reflection tool, you get to understand yourself more. <laughs> Even the ugly side of you that you are ashamed of. It, you get to understand and, you know, as you go through that process, you, you also start to learn to love yourself. And through that process, it opens a whole opportunity of things. You start to have compassion for others too. And, you know, I need to understand who I am how the multiple facets of my identity play a role in my community, and also how my community perceives me with my multiple identities. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, it feels like I, the whole process will help you understand the barriers um, that I feel prevents you from taking actions. And if the barriers exist for me, it exists for everyone. And this is where we apply intersectionality and getting to know the community and understanding them and understanding what are the barriers that prevent them from fully participating as a community member. Um, so I don't want to delay the panel discussion any longer. So after the panel discussion, we will have a quick access exercise in, on intersectionality. You know, we are dissecting ourselves. So stay for that, I appreciate it. And uh, but Back to you, Jen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vara. I think that uh, having that start with DEI in mind and our intersectionality is uh, so important to this panel in particular. So um, our panel today consists of city employees as well as volunteers who collectively have many years of experience and community involvement. I can't wait to hear the discussion between our panelists. So let's get going with that, okay? First, I'd like to welcome our moderator, the current editor of the Shawnee Mission Post and Blue Valley Post, Kyle Palmer. Kyle got his start in journalism at the University of Missouri. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt the, the clapping for Kyle. Very happy you're here at the University of Missouri. <laughs> Maybe when I mentioned the University of Missouri, it might have made people like, oh no. <laughs> yeah. I know. <laughs> Of all of our local great schools, um, where he worked for KVIA, Mid Missouri's NPR affiliate. After college, he spent 10 years as a teacher and went on to get a master's in education policy from Stanford University. Smartest guy in the room, probably. Uh, prior to joining the post in 2020, he served as news director for KCUR. We're so grateful to have you here today, Kyle, uh, to guide this important discussion. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, well, thank you so much to Lee for uh, having me here and the rest of the panel as well. We'll introduce ourselves in just a, a couple of minutes. But um, uh, of course, the Post is, is intensively involved in, in local government. And, and uh, so we're very uh, thankful to, to be a part of this event. And if you don't know about us, very quickly, uh, the Shawnee Mission Post covers the Shawnee Mission area, Northeast Johnson County. We have for the last 13 years, since 2010. And last year, we launched the Blue Valley Post, which covers the Blue Valley area, south of 435 and South Oakland Park in Leewood. So if you have friends who live down there or you yourselves live down there and you're not subscribed, go ahead and tell them, tell them about us. And you can go to ShawneeMissionPost.com or BlueValleyPost.com and you should be greeted with a message that allows you to sign up for uh, get your first month or just a dollar and you can try this out. Uh, but yeah, let's go ahead and move to the panelists and have them introduce themselves and then we can get to some questions. As, as Jen said, there are some some pre-planned questions that we have, but if you have questions that come to mind throughout the event, you can write them down on your index card and um, lead volunteers will be going around to pick those up. And so if you have issues that come up that are not addressed in the questions we already have planned, I hope we can get to some of those by the end of the event. So I'll just turn it over to Ann to have our panelists introduce themselves. We'll start with David. Hey, thank you, Kyle. I'm David Westbrook. I'm uh, very flattered and privileged to be here. I'm a lifelong resident of the Kansas City area. Grew up in the Johnson County community, went to the Shawnee Mission School District from kindergarten through high school graduation in Shawnee Mission West. 
was the Chamber of Commerce Chair for a couple of years and on the board for 10. I feel strongly about the civic engagement and involvement in community building as an enterprise. And so I'm delighted to be here and participate in this and hope through doing so that I can learn as much as I can share my own experience and my own reason for getting involved. Liz? I'm Liz Ruback, assistant to the mayor for the city of Olenka. Uh, in addition to helping the mayor with whatever he needs help with, I also oversee our boards and committees. I run our civic academy, our team council, um, and I run our the mayor's children. And I just have to say, I love the League of Women Voters and the mission. I think it is so important to be an informed voter. And I think one of the most important things you can do to be an informed voter is support local journalism. So thank you to the Shining Mission Group as well. As well. Uh, and then finally, Lori. My name is Lori Curtis Luther. I am the new city manager for Overland Park. Um, my uh, history with the community, I grew up in Olathe, graduated from Olathe North, went to Baker University and on to uh, KU for my master's in public administration. Um, I was an assistant city manager in Overland Park from 2000 to 2005, and then uh, went on to Wisconsin and Illinois to advance my career and had the opportunity to come full circle back to leave the organization and really return home. So uh, it is really a dream come true for me to be able to come back and lead the organization that I was part of early in my career. Um, I'm getting dangerously close to 30 years, and I will let you believe I was 12 when I got started. <laughs> Although that doesn't work. But I am passionate about local government. It is what I've dedicated my career to, and I think today, more than ever, we need engaged residents we can partner and can um, assist because no single elected body can represent every interest in every individual. And it's important to hear every voice uh, to make sure that we are not um, overlooking or disproportionately negatively impacting any individual or group. So that's something that has been important to me for my entire career. And I look forward to uh, hopefully helping over the part uh, ensure that it's hearing all of the voices uh, in our community. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Now let's go into that. Uh, well, I have some questions that you've already prepared, but you need to be thinking about questions that you may have. And, and maybe the best way to do this is we'll kind of rotate who goes first, or not always going in the same order. Um, and, and maybe so we can get through as many questions and issues as possible. You know, have that uh, have that timer in your head. I won't jump in and cut you off, but uh, just have that timer in your head. And we'll start maybe this question with David, and then we'll go down the line and come back uh, for the next question. So uh, this question is, how do citizens of India get involved in local government um, outside of running for office? That can be a big step for a lot of people, a thing that maybe most people don't want to do, <laughs> but so how do you get involved in local government besides just running for local office? And I'll ask them, the man who is actually running for office. <laughs> well, the first time I've ever run for office, but I've been involved in civic volunteerism all my life. And I think the first step is really to identify something that you feel passionate about. Maybe it's children, maybe it's the elderly, maybe it's neighborhoods, maybe it's parks, maybe it's recreational opportunity, maybe it's schools. Whatever it might be, if it ignites your passion, if it pleases your heart, that's probably going to also ignite your talent. And your talent is going to be what uh, is the asset that can be made available to the community to build a better place. I think it's fun to get involved as a volunteer. Um, I think it gives me a great sense of satisfaction when I know that I've given, and that, that I've given in a way that comes from what I hope would be uh, the talent that I have. I think the other point, the other point is to try to find where are you, where do you have a unique point of view? We're all unique, right? We're all unique human beings. But is there something in your life experience that you could bring to civic work that would add value to that work? Uh, maybe experience as a kid, maybe experience in your career, maybe you're training, maybe you're a lawyer, you're a doctor, you're an engineer, or you're a homemaker and you really had a wonderful experience raising kids and you know what? a safe and attractive neighborhood could be all about. So I, I just think find find your passion, identify your talent with humility and find a way 
in the community to apply those mm -hmm. qualities so that the community can be a better place and you can find better satisfaction. Liz, how do you see people getting involved in local government? Um, so one of the things I said I get to do is I run our civic academy, and what that is is a nine-week program where people come and learn all about how the city works, how we make our decisions, the information we use to make our decisions, um, all the data we gather, everything. And a lot of people who sign up for Civic Academy say that they want to get involved in their community, but they just don't know how. And so Civic Academy is a really good opportunity for them to learn about what's going on in the city of Olathe and all the different ways that they can volunteer and be involved because there are plenty. We have 12 boards and committees, um, which is a little over 100 volunteers that um, do really important functions for the city. Um, a lot of them do fundraising and advocacy work. Some of them do critical functions that we are that we are required to do to be able to get things done, like our planning commission, the rezoning, some public hearings, and we have a housing authority. We have a public art committee that's sitting on an art festival this fall in Olathe. Um, so that's one of the very popular ways. A lot of people who go to Civic Academy and then go on to apply for our board and committees. It's a great way to get involved. We also just have a lot of not boards and committees, but just volunteer opportunities as well that I know people really um, enjoy. They get to help put on city events and get to meet some of the people who make the decisions in their city, which is important. So I'm going to be um, unofficially speaking on behalf of my friends in Leewood and Lenexa and other communities that aren't represented here, but just like Olathe, there are numerous opportunities in each of the communities in Johnson County and beyond. Um, for Oakland Park in particular, you go to opkansas.org and you look under city governments. There is an entire page filled with the 15 to 20 boards, commissions, and committees that are seeking volunteers and seeking input. And we also have a team council. We have opportunities for every age and every background. And uh, some of them require you to be a resident, many do not. Uh, but I encourage you to look at the community you live in and find those opportunities because we need to hear your voices. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna editorialize for just a moment. Um, I've again spent about 30 years nearly in local government. I have been nonpartisan every minute of every day of those 30 years. That said, Divisiveness in government right now that is beginning to be reflected in our local governments as well, in my opinion, is dangerous. And the only way to address it is to have more voices heard. And I think it is a critical point in our history to be involved and to be heard and to be present. Um, because I have hope for our democracy. I don't think we're doing um, but I think that we have to be more engaged than perhaps we needed to be in the past. Um, for many years, I think it was more often that you would only hear from people who were really upset about something or really super happy about something. And generally speaking, when you have your budget meetings and, and there's relative silence, things we're pretty much doing our job. Everything's kind of okay. Um, I, I think that we need more people involved and engaged and how you become that potential next elected official is by serving on those boards and commissions getting some experience under your belt and then having that self-confidence to take the next step and potentially run for public office not to suggest that i am seeking any opponents to be involved of course and love individually they're all my favorite um not at all the message i'm trying to portray but in all seriousness um, we need people who are willing to get into this because if someone said, you know, why would you want to run for public office right now? It's kind of ugly. You, you have a lot of potential for negative feedback. Well, we need good people to run for public office. Um, I'm very fortunate uh, to work with some, some amazing individuals. But in order to perpetuate that, we need to grow that talent base, right? And that skill set. So. I, I got a little overwinded, but um, I think it was an important, important point to be made. Okay. Uh, we'll go back to the list for the next question, but jumping off, um, I, I heard 
Kelly uh, Lynn and Lori talk about um, you know, volunteering for committees and boards looking at different opportunities within your cities. What, um, from the city's perspective, what qualifications are you looking for in candidates who might apply or, or people who might want to do some sort of volunteer work in your city? Sure. So for boards and committees, most of our boards and committees, you don't have to live in Olathe. You, it's great if you live in Olathe. It's hard if you live in Olathe. But there are a lot of people who work in Olathe and have really strong connections to the community. So that's not always a requirement. Some of our boards and committees, um, you have to have very specific qualifications, like a board of code review. You have to have um, experience in the industry, like plumbing. Um, but we have a Christians with Disability Advisory Board where we only allow so many people who don't actually have a disability to be on that board. So there are a couple that have very specific qualifications, but for the most part, you really just need to be somebody who cares a lot about the community, who is willing to put in the time to be a good board member. Um, some of our um, some of our boards require different time than others, but you really have to be there. Our boards and committees um, follow the same rules that our city council does. And so we have to have a forum for our boards and committees to be able to do their business. So if you decide at the last minute, oh, I'm too busy, I can't go, it doesn't really work when you're on board and committee because they may not have a forum and they may, may not be able to do the business that they do. So I think the biggest qualifications are um, caring and having the time and also having an open mind. I think we all, um, it would be silly to think that we know everything and we know the best way to do everything. So having an open mind and being willing to help the mission, whatever it is, with whatever information you learn as you go. Well, <laughs> I think we're very similar and there are some specific skill sets that are required for certain positions, but many um, simply require you to be willing uh, to participate and be present in, in all of those things. I have to take a moment to, to speak primarily to the women in the room, um, because my understanding in, in looking at some of the research is that uh, women compared to men on average, whether it's for a job application or a volunteer opportunity, they're going to see a list of criteria that's preferred and say, oh, I only have nine out of ten of these. <laughs> and, uh, and I admit, I did myself a little bit, even applying for a job that I knew I was incredibly well qualified for, I thought, you know, maybe they're looking for somebody with over 30 years of experience. You know, I don't know all of these things that we do to ourselves. And so I, I want to speak to the women who might be thinking that and say, you can figure it out. What you don't know, you can learn. Now, unless it specifically requires you to be an engineer and you're not an engineer, well, that's not going to work. But most of the things that we're looking for um, are going to be opportunities. And so we need men and women alike, um, but we also uh, want to make sure that we're being open to everyone and providing opportunities so that um, it isn't just one voice or a large segment of our population that is being more represented and heard than others. Uh, David, maybe ask a slightly different way for you, but um, someone, ask someone who has uh, volunteer experience and, and put yourself out there in the community, what qualifications have served you or been useful for you in that capacity? Well, you know, one, one area that I've been privileged to work in is I was chair of the Mayor's Committee for People with Disabilities for a number of years. And we were given an opportunity to take a judgment, take a tour, a preview tour of the, uh, of the new streetcar system in downtown Kansas City, and uh, they were very proud to point out to me that uh, the exit sign uh, and the emergency sign both had Braille on them. Uh, well, if you're in an emergency, you got to... <laughs> you found the sign, you probably have gotten as far as you get, right? <laughs> but I did find the Braille, and the Braille was there, indeed. The bad news is it's upside down. Oh, well, uh, I, I use that as an adding of kind of humor, but the point is to, to have your own involvement because of a particular issue and to have uh, some power to make an observation like that. And that whole thing was very instructive to the city. Uh, and so when I think we, when we empower people who have a certain kind of life experience, 
that brings authority to the mm -hmm. And listen to that life experience in a meaningful way. Changes can be brought about. And the other point I think is maybe awfully important is, you know, biology tells us that a diversity, diversity helps the health of a, of a community. Uh, an organism it thrives in a diverse environment. And so I think the more diversity we have in our engagement of citizens and community life, the better off our initiative. We'll start the next question with Lori. Uh, maybe more of a uh, going down more logistical avenue from what you've been talking about, but how much of a commitment, maybe both in terms of time or personal resources, uh, should a person expect when they when they volunteer with your city or use some of the things you've been talking about, like go out for more? You know, I think like so many things, playing sports, uh, any any number of things, you can make the connection to. You're going to get out as much as you put in, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can do the minimum and show up to the meeting, um, or you can really put in the work, um, read all of the materials, ask the questions ahead of time, and be have much more of an impact. So I think you you get out what you put in is really the, the simple answer to that. I am going to quickly um, make one observation. We talk about citizen involvement. Um, I was most recently working in a community that had a significant portion of our population that uh, were non-citizens, and many of them were undocumented. And so I think we have to find ways for individuals who may not fit into that category um, to also have a voice and also be heard. And how we provide safe opportunities um, for that to occur is also um, important. It may not be as significant in Johnson County as in communities where I previously worked, but I think it's something we have to be talking about. Yeah. Uh, David, in your experience, what, what kind of commitment should, should someone be prepared for if they're going to step up for these community and well, I, sometimes there are folks who get involved because they simply want their name to appear on a letterhead because of oh, yeah. the and that's not what I call volunteer commitment. That's that's uh, that's really not. I think you got to be prepared to be involved on the front end to learn and that's what needs to be learned in order for your opinion to be rooted in some understanding of the issues. Of that. So it's going to take several hours a week uh, service on the school board, which is what I'm. Uh, signing up to try to have a privilege to do is probably going to be a 15 to 20 hour a week commitment and do it right. And do it right. It's not a paid position. And so you've got to have to take that time out of your, either your, your work or your recreational activity or your family life or your sleep. <laughs> so you to give up something to do that. And I think people who volunteer for this kind of work have to be prepared to do that. And uh, and be honest about it, because the worst thing you can do is get involved and realize the time and emotional commitment required to do it or just be in excess of what's available. That doesn't help you or your community at all. And Liz ran out this question that the commitment you can get needs for the community volunteers. So our boards and committees, it varies a lot. We have one committee that meets once a year. We have some that meet quarterly, most meet monthly. Planning commission, you meet twice a month, and you have a huge packet that you have to read and comprehend and be able to make decisions on before you can um, go to that meeting. And meeting. Sometimes they're 20 minutes, sometimes they're three hours. So it really just depends. So I would just recommend um, just do your research, find the people who can, you can ask the questions to about what you're interested in, find out what the time commitment is, because there are um, a wide range of opportunities depending on your availability. The next question we'll start with David, and I will just remind the audience if you have questions that you have had that have come to mind, you can write them down at the next start. I believe we volunteers are hovering on the sidelines. If you, <laughs> time, if you have some cards, you think someone to let go, but we should have some time towards the end to take some audience questions as well. Uh, the next question we'll start with David. Um, uh, so, uh, multiple of you kind of have alluded to in your previous answers, but what barriers or challenges might uh, any potential volunteers encounter as they try to pursue service opportunities in their community? Um, you yeah, know, so just the barriers and challenges that they might face. Well, sometimes you find the, uh, the, the folks who are working as administrators or the professional team um, 
is reluctant for you to be too involved because the defense of McLaughlin might be perceived as your ulterior or what are called political motive. So you get to be patient with the staff, to let staff uh, get to know you better and you get to know them better to try to build trust. Trust is essential if you're going to involve yourself in a volunteer sense. I think um, another barrier is that we just have, as Lori just said a few minutes ago, we have an atmospheric in our country right now, which suggests that politics is a team sport about winning and defeating and losing. And, you know, I, the Tocqueville wrote in 1938 when we wrote a book called Democracy in America, what about association of volunteers who come together to build a better community? Through employing our talents and our volunteer time to see if the community can get better. And if we built buildings, we built infrastructure, we built uh, places that the community could drop on those in those years. I think that's very, still very, very important. So I guess the other barrier is don't think you're being, oh my God, I would never be involved in politics, somebody says to me. Well, that's a reason you should get involved. <laughs> if things are not going well there, then find a way to make them uh, uh, better without getting in the fray of who's right, who's wrong, who's good, who's bad. That's not what uh, the democratic process in our country is all about. It's not what it should be. Does Rebecca get challenged with barriers that people might potentially face if they're exploring uh, volunteer opportunities? Um, <clears throat> so, I want to piggyback a little bit off something Lori said about women getting involved. Um, in addition to um, not many women feeling that they're not qualified while they 100% are, um, we also see that there aren't enough women on the more influential boards like planning commission, housing authority, stuff like that. So please don't be afraid to step up for something that is more challenging because your voice is really important and we need your voice. Um, and then I know we're not talking about um, elected officials, right? But there are a lot of the people who want to get involved with the community, and so they just jump straight to running for city council, and then it doesn't go anywhere because nobody knows who they are. So sometimes, and similarly, there are some boards and committees that um, there's higher interest in, like the planning commission and um, citizens' police advisory council, stuff like that. And so if um, sometimes it's good to get involved, make connections, get to know your community and people, and then um, that uh, opens doors a little bit more for some of those higher profile opportunities if that's true. And then Lori, uh, challenges, barriers? I'm gonna speak only to my own experience. I'm a professional staff member who's appointed. Um, I think that as, as a woman in a position of authority, I was part of, continue to be part of what is known as the 13% club. 13% mm. um, club is a group of, of women um, who have been the chief executive or administrative officer of the governing um, bodies that they serve and serving in that top position. And uh, they did a study in the, in the 80s. And at the time, about 13% held those top positions. Mm -hmm. 20 years later, they redid the study and discovered Heard that we had made zero progress and 13% continues to be the norm. Did a lot of digging. Well, is it that the, the boards that are doing the hiring and the selection, um, are they being discriminatory or what is the issue? And come to find out, um, the most significant factor was internal. We were graduating as many women as men from master's uh, programs in public administration. We had the same qualifications that there were fewer of us seeking the position. Okay. It was completely self-imposed. And sometimes that's for good reason. Um, due to a, a desire for life balance, um, fewer were wanting to take on the additional responsibility. Well, I'm here to tell you with four children of my own, two dogs, an axolotl, some African cichlids, um, little <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can have a robust, big personal life and a robust professional life. It's not easy. I'm not going to suggest that it is, but we need to get out of our own way, is my message. So that can be a barrier. Don't let it be. Yeah, it's my um, The next question we'll start with, uh, we'll go back to Liz. So um, you mentioned 
uh, commissions, boards, and potentially running for elected office, but what are the services in parts of county and municipal government um, are there that maybe the average citizen doesn't think about or know about on a day-to-day -day basis that could use some real um, support and volunteer attention? Um, so Olathe is a full service city, so there are a lot of services Olathe offers that we that people don't even realize we do. Um, and almost everything that we do, particularly the public facing thing, um, there are opportunities for volunteers. We have volunteers at our courts, we have volunteers in our police department, um, pretty much everywhere. So, like I said, I really think it's about um, figuring out what you're passionate about and um, I'm sure there is a way for you to be involved in the being that manager. So just making the call to find out um, how you can help. Or well, parts of the, the, the municipal government in Overland Park and other cities that you work in that might be passed over by the average you might not know about them. So I learned about over the course of the past year, and I'm a little hesitant to share because it is on my bucket list of retirement jobs. <laughs> we actually have baby goat socializers. Deanna Richards said, I have photos to prove it. It's the most delightful volunteer job. I do believe there's a waiting list, so I call that the Um, But it's once they're a week old, you have people come in to start socializing the baby goat, and um, it's fantastic. So, yeah. For me personally, it's right up there with with dropping the babies at the hospital. Um, so the the long story short is there are so many ways that you can get involved. If you're an animal lover, um, whether it's through our farmstead or through um, the Humane Society, if your passion, as was earlier indicated, is in another area, um, I can guarantee we can find a spot for you. David Brown asked this question uh, services in the county municipal and local governance organization do the average citizen doesn't know about? Well, I'll give you, I think, I, I think the action takes place in committees. I mean, the glamour is at the board meeting when somebody takes a vote and it passes or doesn't. And sometimes the board meetings do not carry on the kind of discussion that gives the community a really understanding of what's going on with specific policy. We, there was a committee meeting in Shawnee Mission the other day to discuss, of all things, how cell phones will be monitored and managed in the classroom. Well, most of us, when we grew up, didn't have cell phones in our, in our, in our possession, certainly not in the classroom. All the kids have cell phones. What are you going to do? You know, mom and dad want access to the kids immediately by texting, and the moms and dads don't. They think that cell phones are going to be locked up during the day. Others are concerned about the $1,500 cell phone that gets locked up. And stolen. I mean, there are a whole bunch of issues around a simple technology like a cell phone and all sorts of divisive views about how much kids should have access to them or not. It takes up a lot of time. It was a very robust discussion, a lot of input, and a lot of different points to view to figure out how to round out a simple policy to that be a pretty complex issue. The action takes place at the committee where parents are involved where the school administrators are involved, where teachers are involved, where they talk about how it affects the classroom. That is really good stuff that has to be worked through, thought through, articulated, and then brought to the school board for policy. That's where the action is. That's where your volunteer opinions and expertise can really have an impact. That doesn't sound very sexy. It is pretty important issues in terms of how much class time is spent managing something like that. And it's at a committee work or the real world takes place. Uh, maybe there's a follow-up to this and maybe more specifically for, for Liz and Laura, but what is, what's just a, a practical step that someone additional can take, you know, today, tomorrow, to follow up and like find these opportunities to go to your city websites today. Um, I mean, where can they serve? Where can they call? So I think our websites are a great resource. And um, those, like I said, any community that you live in, and if you are having trouble, contact one of us, and we will point you in the right direction. Um, those are a great first place. And if you're not quite, quite ready to maybe fill out an application to serve on a committee um, or a board, then there are other volunteer opportunities or opportunities for public input. Um, we're going through right now, it's called Framework OP. It is a comprehensive planning effort that we are actively going out and looking for groups um, to provide input on, on plans for the future. And so 
those opportunities exist. Again, most of those are on our website. I know that the communities have the same um, opportunities as well, uh, but I think that, that really it's um, an overwhelming number of opportunities. So if you need help whittling those down, um, certainly there are city employees throughout that would be happy to, to work with you and help you decide um, where your voice can best be heard. All of our board and committee meetings are also open to the public. So even if you're not appointed to the board, you can attend. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people do that. And some of our board and committees also have volunteer arms. So again, even if you're not appointed, there are ways you can support the community. And that's, um, we have, particularly like I mentioned, for some of our board and committees that there's higher interest in, a lot of people um, will be appointed to it after they've attended the meetings and volunteered with them for a while. And similarly, all of that information is on our website about who the staff contact person is and when the meetings are. We we'll certainly get some audience questions. If you have those, certainly pass those along to the lead volunteers. We just have a couple more uh, pre-planned questions I was going to ask and we can get to some audience questions. But if rotation is falling uh, to Lori after that follow-up question, but are there are there other organizations uh, that cities and local governments partner with that might be out of the purview of the actual city that um, people who are volunteer minded could also get involved in that way that you work with? Oh, absolutely. And so I mentioned the you know, Humane Society. There are also any number of food pantries or um, other nonprofit organizations that provide specific services to residents within the county. Um, and they're always looking for volunteers and for assistance on their boards and committees. Um, so look to my, my partner here to, to see if there are others that she can think of off the top of her head. Um, we also have a lot of um, organizations that are regional or um, through the Mid-America Regional Council or um, partners within the service arms of Johnson County government. Um, I actually, before I was an assistant in Overland Park, I briefly worked for the Human Services and Aging Department in Johnson County. And they had a number of partnerships with direct service providers and Meals on Wheels. And they're always looking for drivers and for um, for others who can help support them. So any of those um, organizations are always looking for for them. Uh, we partner with so many different community organizations, two of the biggest being the school district in the county. Um, for example, we do um, something called Communities That Care, and it's a coalition with the city, the school district, the county, the police department, and they do a lot of um, events to educate young people and educate their parents about the dangers of drinking and drug use and the importance of taking care of your mental health. And they certainly have volunteer opportunities. Um, and we, I believe the city is working with the school district to put on um, an event next weekend, the Culture Fest, I think it's called. So it, I had no idea before I worked at the city how many different ways the city partners with other organizations in the community. It kind of blows my mind a little bit. So that kind of just speaks to, you know, getting involved um, so that you really have your ear to that kind of stuff that's happening. So you can find out about those opportunities. David, your experience working with organizations outside of the city level? Yeah, the health department is a really important part of you know, for schools because oftentimes kids actually don't have access to a primary care doctor. And they get they get a portal to that doctor through the partnership that comes from the health department with the school district and um, an advanced practice nurse that shows up at the school um, on a regular basis to have a, um, a student come in and check out immunization, start a primary care relationship with the provider. I think you know a healthy kid is a kid that's going to be far more able and ready to learn. Uh, we're, um, the school board is not. To help organization, but to provide access to the services and partnerships, that's really important. Uh, this question is really for anyone who wants to jump in. Um, we've seen city council members um, mention things like the neighborhood executive committee. Uh, what is that, I and mean, how does this get involved in that? Does it sound like something that can be right at you as well? So that might be an entry point for some people. So I think that's specific to the city of Oakland Park. Um, in Oakland Park, there are many homeowners associations, and, and I think many of the communities throughout have them. So your homeowners association is a way to begin getting involved. In Oakland Park, we also have what's called the Neighborhood Executive Committee, 
because not every neighborhood in Overland Park is a homeowners association. Mm -hmm. And there was um, historically a need to, to have some um, assistance with these neighborhoods that um, frankly were mostly in our older neighborhoods, uh, were put in existence before homeowners associations were all the rage. And it gave them an opportunity um, to come collectively together and get some staff assistance that you might uh, see happening in some of the newer neighborhoods that had more robust HOA. So that is specific to Overland Park. Um, they have representatives, and um, you know they're dealing with some really gritty issues like um, uh, solid waste collection and recycling. Those are managed usually through your homeowners association if you live in Overland Park. The city itself does not provide those services in our community. Um, well, if you live in a smaller neighborhood, you don't have the buying power that the larger neighborhoods have. How can we start looking a little more strategically at how we can provide opportunities for those neighborhoods to work together um, to get that same level of buying power? We haven't worked that out yet. We don't have a solution in place. But it's one of the things we're working on to try and, and help them achieve. I think that may be specific to, to Oakland Park. Well, listen, David, do you see any opportunities for people to jump in or enter, you know, volunteer service at the neighborhood level? Absolutely. I mean, um, it would be silly of us to think that every neighborhood has the same resources. Um, I know our CEP is tapped on which um, neighborhoods have HOAs and which ones don't. And again, a lot of the um, Older neighborhoods don't have HOAs, and the city works with them in various ways to communicate the opportunity to them, like some neighborhood improvement grants, um, and home improvement grants, and stuff like that. I know the city, um, in one of our older neighborhoods without an HOA, did a program where they partnered with Habitat for Community and Church of the Resurrection, where there's a rock the block, yeah. and a bunch of volunteers go out um, and do improvements to the neighborhood that normally an HOA would maybe pay for, um, but they don't have an HOA. You know, I don't have any specific example except like the HOAs in Johnson County and very uh, engaged and very important part of how we need to have the community together. I, 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 and that's what happens in the grassroots level. Concerned about trash in the neighborhood, and concerned about crime or, or maybe a, a little bit of violence that you've seen in the neighborhood with kids misbehaving, so the HOAs can really make it. If some, uh, uh, audience questions and really rotation's kind of done, so everyone wants to jump in first can, can do that on these questions. But I'll start with this one. Um, all three of you uh, at some point already have kind of um, elo eloquently stated, you know, the mindsets and qualifications to look for for people who, who want to come into volunteer um, positions. They to say not everyone does that. Um, so how do you deal with uh, uh, members or commission members or volunteers that? Um, do end up being maybe disruptive, or maybe they they don't join the board um, or committees to further uh, their own personal agenda. What's the best way to do that? If you if you are trying to keep the right mindset about, about what you're doing uh, at a volunteer level. So we have a code of ethics um, that the city council has um, approved as a policy, and in addition to applying to the city council, it applies to all of our board meetings too. So there are things written in black and white that are board meetings. And then additionally, I think that's why terms of so um, if somebody maybe isn't fulfilling their service as well as we would like to, there's always an opportunity when their term comes up to say thank you for your service. I think that's good. Yeah. I don't mean to dismiss the, the fact that that happens, but I think one thing that we can do is assume good intention. If we assume good intention, um, I, you know, intimidation being what it is, I can hear the same words coming out of two individual staff, and my reaction, my reaction is going to be very different based upon who is delivering that message. It's really incumbent upon me to assume good intention and to really respond in, in a way that maintains the high ground and that um, perhaps dismisses my own narrative about what their motivation may or may not be. How can I handle that question in a way that is ultimately fair um, and, and even-handed and doesn't assume what their motivation is? And that's really hard to do, but I think that really is the first step. And if you handle each of those situations in that fashion, you'll find the folks that are really motivated to um, make things better and not just be 
you know, serving out of self-interest, um, you know, I, I think that you're going to get past those hurdles, um, but you really have to exercise that that internal um, reaction uh, in, in a fair and even-handed way, which is it's hard to do. I would I would applaud that, and I think it's also important for us to remember that sometimes we won't agree, but we do have to respect everybody's opportunity to be heard. And I think if somebody has expressed themselves in a way that's passionate, that is in the minority and the issue, they deserve the opportunity to be respected, and most important of all, they have to celebrate that we've created an opportunity for those people to be heard. Well, those people, my people, they're not wrong, they like people, which is the opportunity to be heard. That's, consensus is not about everybody agreeing. Consensus is that we thought we could be able to well create a civil opportunity for everyone to be heard and what points we do in I'll uh, we'll do one more question, and then I believe there's some some things to do afterwards after the, the panel is done. So this will be the, the final question that I'll ask, and it does come from the audience. Um, the question, as it's worded, is best to be involved via advocacy, which I take to mean if you want to get involved, but you do have a particular, um, I don't want to say political agenda, but you, you want to advocate for a particular cause, whether it be involved with schools or, or helping in terms of the libraries. Um, how do you get involved if that is, if that is what your passion is? You do want to be I'm going to share in my experience. Um, it only takes one person in the room to shift the policy decision. One person in the room. Almost every decision a uh, city council is going to make is going to have some opportunity for public comment or public hearing. And you can be the absolute difference between a decision on an item being approved or not. Show up. And, and have those opportunities in those public comments, whether it's three minutes or, or what. Um, I have seen it time and time and time again where I am predicting the outcome of an issue and it is completely changed based on the makeup of the room in that moment. So don't underestimate the power that you have to be heard and influence those decisions. <laughs> And I also want to say, I think, um, I don't know if anybody in this room has ever tried to reach out to your city council, but I think your city council might be a little more accessible than many people realize. I think there are some boards and committees where a certain level of advocacy is appropriate and even encouraged. Um, but if there is a particular issue that really is more a city council issue and not something that that board of city should be working on, then you know, go to your website and you can probably find your city council members' emails, their phone numbers, they do read their emails. Um, we similarly have a public comment period in all of our city council meetings where everybody is welcome. If you live or work in a lake, you can come and talk about whatever is important to you. Um, so yeah, so reach out. I think also just don't, don't get bored with your own stories. If somebody hasn't uh, responded the way you want, you've got to be able to come like a, I said from the Department of Amendments in the Department. You know, <laughs> you know, keep repeating the story over and over again so people can absorb it and have a chance to understand what you stand for. And then uh, be simple, be brief, and do that. Well, David, uh, West Berkeley, we're back. Gloria, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. and. Uh, Thank you all so for this for all the work you do and all the volunteering and the service that you provide down in town. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'll turn back over to Lee. Thank you, Tom. Hi again. I think you all have received the little paper on the intersecting items just so I'm gonna give you about maybe a minute or two to just kind of go through it and uh, you know, just choose the attributes um, for yourself, circle them, um, check, check them off. And uh, if you have, I have extra pens with me, pens here. Can you see it? And um, I just want to say also that this exercise can cause a little discomfort because it might be anyone's first time to truly just kind of understanding the multi facets of their identities. Um, I also do need um, an interactive participation and I will ask you if uh, like you are free to volunteer.
You can also add additional attributes if it's not listed on there. I'll give it another thirty seconds before we can proceed. <laughs> <laughs> all right is everyone done or almost done yeah. yeah okay so i want to look at these attributes and i want you to i guess think about is everyone done yeah perfect all right, so I want you to look at all these attributes and I want you to tell me or give your thoughts on, um, you know, how do you feel, like which part of these attributes or identity do you feel that's hindering you from voicing out your, you know, your opinion for, for, for you to utilize you to, for you to your power to speak up and do something. Anyone? Can you say a little louder? Yeah. So I want you to identify these attributes that you ticked off on the form. I want you to kind of look through them and tell me like which of these attributes that you feel is a hindrance to you from speaking out and participating from really using your power to do good and make that change for whatever reason. <laughs> yeah, I have that listed on my on my home too. Uh, also, yes, previous and current stress and previous current anxiety. But what what if I tell you that this is also a good thing that your stress and anxiety, you're not the only one experiencing that. I'm currently anxious right now because I have no too much light roast coffee. <laughs> and you know, and I'm still up here and I'm terrified of public speaking. But here I am. And what I think my point is really when it comes to this identity is that these are not bad things. These are just you. And it doesn't matter who what these attributes are, you're you. Your experience is unique and you have contributed, you know, you can contribute, you will contribute to things because you as a person have this lived experience that's only uniquely to you. So your voice matters. I can talk about my problems all day long, but you may not necessarily understand that because you don't live my life. And vice versa. And the thing here is, I think it's important to really have a discourse and, and understanding each other fully, and not just on a, on a shallow level, but in order for us to really fully participate in community, for us to really, really make that change, no matter how uncomfortable it is, we need to understand ourselves first, and only then we can extend that compassion towards other people and, and, and understand them and their role, even how we can all get together and as a collective to make that real change on a local level. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's the whole point of um, exercise today. Thank you so much for listening and participating. And um, Jay, thank you, Tara, and um, thank you for this exercise on intersectionality and how we can apply it to not only our own life but how we can advocate, how we can um, participate in the community. So these are some of the things that I picked up from our wonderful panel. And again, thank you to um, Kyle and our panelists for giving us this their wisdom. Um, I heard ignite your passion. So what's your passion? That's, that's a great way to start. If your passion is parks, if your passion is art, there's a board for you. Um, you have a unique 
by the very definition of what we just did with the intersectionality, you have a very unique point of view and use it. Use that unique point of view because your voice and that point of view is important. Um, keep showing up, keep, use, keep using your voice, keep telling your story. Um, and what you don't know about a particular board, you can always learn. If you don't know about parks, except that you know that they exist, you can learn about parks um, or any other thing. Um, so uh, again, thank you to our panel. I hope you took away something that you can use in your own community, but I also wanna give another plug for our observers for and I want to do a big shout out to Nancy Allen. She has made a point to share her story on a couple of occasions when she was new to Johnson County and Overland Park. She started going to the Overland Park City Council meetings as part of the Observer Court, and that's where she learned more about her city. Um, so it's a great opportunity for you as a league member. If you're not a league member, it's still a great opportunity. Um, updates from the Observer Corps um, helps leaguers and the general public stay informed about what's happening in various municipals, um, municipals um, the county, and school boards. So um, again, please contact Eileen Marshall for how you want to become involved. So, what happens in May that we all think about? Mother's Day. Mother's Day. What else? Graduations. Graduations. Memorial Day. There's lots out there. Drinking water week. <laughs> Drinking water week. So, May, May has a lot of uh, things happening. June has a lot of ha things happening. Did you know? that membership in the league makes for a perfect gift <laughs> for Mother's Day, graduation, <laughs> celebrating <laughs> Memorial Day, just about anything. So visit our website at www.lwbjoco.org to see how you can make that gift of the league membership be the biggest gift of all. So, and speaking of membership, how many of you are a member of the league? Show of hands. Oh, great. How many of you have joined since January? All right. Well, great. Excellent. We are so glad that you are all here um, and that you're a member of the league. Um, I do you know that we've had five members since our, our last month. So we welcome new members. And um, if you're a recent new member, we'd like to have you step over to this empty table over here. Um, Nancy will, Nancy and one of either Janet or myself, we'll just have a nice cool welcome for you, personalized welcome for you. So our work is not complete without members and your volunteers. So it's because of your dedicated volunteers, your passion in voting, your passion in the league that makes our work complete. So continuing on with summer, June, summer, what else do you do in the summer? Okay. That's one thing. <laughs> The picnic. We do have a picnic on, um, it's a, the summer celebration picnic. So it kind of continues our celebrations that we started in January. Um, and this picnic will be Thursday, June 22nd from 4 to 8 p.m. at Tomahawk Hills Clubhouse in Shawnee. So look for that information. And, you know, how many of you... Um, really think gun safety is about public health. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. So that's exactly what our program is gonna be Saturday, June 3rd at the Meadowbrook Park Clubhouse in Prairie Village, kind of right down the road a little bit. 
Um, it will feature Judy Sherry from Grandparents for Gun Safety and award-winning opinion writer, Mark McCormick. I am looking forward to that discussion. We will have social time beginning at nine with the program starting at 9, 9.30. So join us for that very important conversation. When is that again? June 3rd, it's a Saturday. I think we need to recognize that we are the largest county in Kansas, and really we have made a big, big difference. I'm 89 years old, I come from Victoria a long time ago, and I was mayor long, long time ago. My first woman, lots of things, and by gosh, you can do it. You really can make a difference. Use right. that passion and make a difference. So thank you all for sharing your Saturday morning with us, and we will look forward to seeing you again really soon, whether it's at the picnic, June 3rd, Mother's Day, graduation. Go out and have a great day.